Good afternoon and welcome to our program today, the Alliance Working in Washington, Impacts of the U.S.-Japan Relationship with Dr. Green, Dr. Katata, and Dr. Salee. I just quickly wanted to let you know how to uh, ask your question. If you prefer to write your question, you can still type your question in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And I just want to remind you all that be sure you are using the Q&A box and not the chat box. Um, if you would like to ask your question directly to the speaker, you can do so by um, raising using the raise your hand function. To do this, you can click on the icon labeled participants at the bottom center of your screen. And at the bottom of your window on the right side of the screen, you can click the button lab labeled raise hand. When your name is called by the moderator, the World Affairs Council staff will unmute you. A pop-up will appear on your screen, giving you the option to remain muted or to unmute yourself. Select the option to unmute yourself. Once you are unmuted, please introduce yourself and ask your questions. The attendees will not be able to see you. They will only be able to hear your voice. And when you are done asking your questions, be sure to mute yourself again by clicking the microphone icon at the bottom left corner of the screen. We will reset you as a regular attendee. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, and welcome, everyone. I'm Jackie Miller, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council here in Seattle. Thank you for joining us for today's really important discussion on the U.S.-Japan relationship, certainly an important one that we follow here in Seattle. We're very grateful to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA for sponsoring this program and to Bill Clifford and Liz Brailsford of the World Affairs Councils of America for suggesting that we work with Sasakawa uh, to bring this conversation to Seattle. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to ask Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa USA, to give a quick welcome. Shanti. Hello, thank you so much, Jackie, and good afternoon, everyone from uh, Washington, DC. Pre-COVID, I would be there in Seattle joining you all in person, and while it's a shame uh, that we can't do that this time around, I'm so thankful that we can still all virtually come together for this program. I'd like to thank the World Affairs Councils of America and the World Affairs Council of Seattle for partnering with Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA to bring this program to life there in Seattle. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit located in DC. Our mission is to deepen the understanding of and strengthen the relationship between the US and Japan, focusing mainly on security and diplomacy within the Asia Pacific context. We do this through events such as today's, exchanges, publications, and networking. Today's event is part of Sasakawa USA's uh, The Alliance Working in America series, or TAWA, as we say for short. We recognized early on that engaging only the Washington, D.C. community is not enough to really shore up and secure strong U.S. support for U.S.-Japan Alliance. Therefore, we launched TAWA. Uh, with the goal to reach out to regional leaders and influencers in U.S. cities on the importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance to U.S. interests, both regionally and at national levels. And we're very honored to have the distinguished speakers that we have today to speak about just this and the importance of that alliance in Washington state and the surrounding areas. So thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks, Shanti. It's been great working with you and Benji to, to realize this program. And as someone who used to live inside the Beltway and is now in the other Washington, um, I could not agree more that it is important uh, to get outside of the Beltway and, and um, bring these kind of conversations uh, to, to the country um, uh, as a whole. Um, before introducing our really well-placed speakers, I want to give you a quick look at some of our upcoming programs. We are into December. I don't know how that happened, but it is December of 2020. Um, and so we're only going to have one more public program before we take a few weeks off. On December 11th, we'll be looking at how COVID-19 is driving huge increases in food insecurity in Latin America, and we're partnering with the World Food Program uh, for that discussion. When we start back up in January, we're going to be having a conversation with former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd on China's global strategy. That's going to be January 6th. Uh, on January 12th, we're going to be joined by Tom Wright of the Brookings Institution for a look at President-elect uh, Biden's foreign policy inbox. Uh, spoiler alert, it's a very, very full inbox. Uh, January 21st, we're going to be looking at the U.S.-Canada-Mexico relationship with the consuls uh, here in Seattle. 
February 3rd, we're going to be looking at the war in Yemen uh, with Ambassador Barbara Bodine, former U.S. Ambassador to Yemen. There are more programs to be added, uh, so please check our website for more information and to register. But today, we are looking at this crucial U.S.-Japan relationship and have three really terrific speakers to help us get smarter about the opportunities and the challenges uh, for both countries. I've had to abbreviate their very impressive bios uh, to make sure that we actually have time to get to some conversation today rather than the telling you about uh, how, how really terrific they are. I'm going to start with our West Coast speaker uh, and then move east. Um, Dr. Saori Hatada is Professor of Political Science and International Relations um, at the University of Southern California. She has a new book out this year that is strategically placed on her bookshelf. There we go. <laughs> um, and in fact, all of our speakers are at various stages of new books. Um, but Saori's book is Japan's New Regional Reality, Geoeconomic Strategy in the Asia Pacific. And that just came out uh, in July. She's also a co-author of two recent books because, you know, a book a year seems about a good pace, I guess. Uh, the Bricks and Collective Financial Statecraft and Taming Japan's Deflation, the Debate Over Unconventional uh, Monetary Policy. Her PhD is from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, and her BA is from Hitotsubashi University in Tokyo. Before joining the faculty of USC, she served as a researcher at the World Bank in Washington, DC, so has also done the obligatory stint in the other Washington, um, and was also an international program officer uh, in Mexico City, working with the uh, United Nations Development Program. She is joined by Dr. Mireya Soli, who's a frequent collaborator with Dr. Kadada, I saw um, on, on the publications. They've co-written or co-edited a few books, plus book chapters and, and journal, journal articles. Uh, so uh, I think uh, know each other quite well. Mireya is the center uh, director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies, the Philip Knight Chair in Japan Studies, and a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Prior to Brookings, uh, she was a tenured associate professor at the American University School of International Service. Her most recent book is Dilemmas of a Trading Nation, Japan and the United States in the Evolving Asia Pacific Order. But she's also working on a new book on Japan's uh, global role and has a really great foreign affairs article that's kind of previewing um, her argument there. She earned her doctorate in government and a master's in East Asian studies from Harvard University and a bachelor's in international relations from El Colegio de Mexico. Finally, last but not least, is uh, Dr. Michael Green, who is Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at the Center for, international, Center for Strategic and International Studies. I shouldn't have screwed that one up. I used to work there. Uh, he's also Director of Asian Studies at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He served on the staff of the National Security Council um, under George W. Bush, focusing on East Asia and South Asia. And before joining NSC staff, he was a senior fellow for East Asian security at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also worked in Japan on the staff of a member of the National Diet. He's authored, also authored numerous books um, and articles on East, Asia, East Asian security and has a new book coming out next year, which is just 30 days away, um, uh, looking at Japan's security policy. And this is one of my favorite things ever to note in an introduction thus far. Uh, Dr. Green has won international prizes on the Great Highland Bagpipe. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, so you see we're in, we're in excellent hands uh, for today's discussion. As a reminder, you can get into the queue to ask your question at any point. Please don't wait for me to say I will now open the floor um, to questions, you can raise your virtual hand or submit a question via the Q&A box. Again, not the chat box, the Q&A box um, at any point. And just a reminder, if you do raise your hand, um, you're going to be unmuted or you'll have to unmute yourself and then you'll get to read the question or say your question directly to the panelists. Um, but if you put it in the chat function, I will go ahead um, and read it to the panelists. Please be sure to identify yourself um, so we know who we're calling on, either with a virtual hand raise or with the chat. And with that, let's get to today's program. Just a reminder today, we are going a little longer today. We have three fantastic speakers. There's a lot to talk about. So instead of ending at one, as we normally would, we're going to end at 1.15. And I want to thank our speakers and also all the, uh, the participants for um, giving us a bit more of your time today to, to go into a bit more depth. So I wanna talk about trade and I wanna talk about security and I wanna talk about economic statecraft and I wanna talk about you know, policy recommendations for the incoming Biden administration. Um, but I'm gonna start off with a question about Japan's new prime minister. I think that might be really important to kind of help set the stage. Um, so Yoshihide Suga, 
uh, on September 16th became uh, Japan's first new prime minister in nearly eight years, uh, having served previously as um, former Prime Minister Abe's uh, cab chief cabinet secretary throughout that administration. So Suga is, is going to be a bit of a mystery uh, to us here in Seattle, to, to uh, us in the United States, and, and maybe even in Japan. Um, his resume does seem a little thin on foreign policy. So let's just lay some some basics here. And who is Suga? Should we expect any new direction from him? Or do you expect him largely to be a caretaker leader uh, until next fall's election? And, and sorry, I'll start with you. And then we can um, just uh, everyone else can jump in. Yes. Thank you. And it's an honor to be here, honor to be with these two real experts of Japan's uh, foreign policy. I would you know, hope I can add some from the West Coast perspective. Uh, so in order, you know, answering your question about Prime Minister Suga, I mean, he's definitely a, kind of a person unknown. He has been the kind of behind the scene guy for eight, well, almost eight years uh, under Prime Minister Abe as the chief cabinet uh, secretary. At the same time, you know, he, because he's, he presided over this uh, cabinet office, which is really important for Prime Minister Abe's uh, foreign policy and domestic policy decision-making, he's plugged into many of, many of these aspects of foreign policy that uh, Prime Minister Abe conducted. You know, to what extent he can kind of uh, promote the prominence and the kind of presence of Japan in the world is still in, in question because I don't think he has the, the same level of network. He, he has the same level of kind of a presence or maybe charisma in some ways uh, of uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, in attending and you know, being all over the world, uh, promoting Japan's, uh, you know, Japan's uh, presence and prominence. At the same time, you know, when it comes to the foreign policy policies themselves, I really think he well he would he would definitely uh, follow uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, footsteps, uh, both in terms you know, in various aspects. You know, security ones. I will leave it to Mike to respond. But you know, in terms of economic policies, uh, Indo-Pacific is important. You know, CPTPP, RCEP, all these uh, mega free trade agreements have been important, and also balancing Japan's relationship with the United States, which is the, you know, definitely the most important. But uh, uh, and China is important for. Um, so, Mike, what, what do you think? Uh, same kind of same trend lines as Abe? Generally, I think that's right. Um, you know, Mr. Suga had the job of chief cabinet secretary, which is 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 not a position that correlates with anything in the U.S. It's kind of a combination of chief of staff of the White House, a little bit national security advisor, and White House press spokesman. Um, it's a parliamentary system, of course, in Japan. So the chef de cabinet, the chief of cabinet, is not something Americans are familiar with. But I would argue that um, he he was probably the most powerful person after Abe within the cabinet. Not in terms of rank necessarily, but in terms of having the inside uh, job of getting things done. And and he got things done. The bureaucrats really respected him. So does business. You know, when he was told Japan's tourism industry was underperforming. He called in all the relevant bureaucrats, told them to make it easier to get visas, easier to get around Japan. They all pushed back and he said, I want an answer by uh, next Tuesday. And he did it and Japan's tourism industry tripled uh, under Prime Minister Abe. And he's done that in other areas. So his nickname is Mr. Fix-It. Um, he relishes that kind of bureaucratic combat. I, I actually know him pretty well. I've, I've, I've met with him numerous times um, over the years. And I think he's essentially going to continue Abe's foreign policy line, as, as Professor Katana says. If there's a difference with Abe, it's that Suga is not as ideological. You know, Prime Minister Abe was the son of a foreign minister and grandson of, of, of Mr. Kishi, who became prime minister, but was initially purged during the US occupation and was later, as prime minister, driven out of power for signing the US-Japan Security Treaty. So Prime Minister Abe has a as prime minister had a little bit more of a of an ideological edge, a little bit more of an axe to grind. Um, Suga-san's parents, you know, were strawberry farmers, and he's a pragmatist. So I think you'll see a little bit more pragmatic line. But as as Sauri said, he doesn't have the international network that Abe had because, as chief cabinet secretary, he only left Japan once to go to Washington D.C. He, he his job is not to travel. So she's right about that. He, it's not clear if he'll be able to build a personal network that Abe had, because he doesn't have that, that travel. But he's an incredibly effective um, 
uh, action guy. He gets things done. And I think we'll be a good friend for the US. Maria, can you, um, if there's anything else you want to add to that, but also take on this, this, is he going to be a caretaker or do we expect him to run in next fall's elections? Do we expect him to actually compete to remain prime minister or is this largely just keeping things together till the next election? Thank you very much, Jackie. And first of all, I want to um, acknowledge that I'm, um, it's great to be here at this session. And I want to thank the World Affairs Council in Seattle and the Sasakawa Foundation. And it's great to be with uh, Saori and Mike. And they've already provided a lot of you know, very good points about uh, the profile of Mr. Sue and what we can expect. And I'm glad, Jackie, that you also bring this question of whether he will be a short uh, term prime minister or if he has larger aspirations. And just to add an accent on some of the things that Sari and Mike already mentioned, but also talk a little bit about the domestic priorities and then his political uh, fortunes. I would emphasize that if we know something about that really distinguished the uh, time of Prime Minister Abe is that he ran a very tight, effective uh, Prime Minister's office. I became almost like control power, so to speak. And Mr. Sue was critical uh, to that. So as Mike said, coordinating and making sure that the bureaucracies moved in tandem and that key uh, policy priorities were delivered on uh, was largely Mr. Suga's uh, doing. And I think it should not surprise us that he actually wants to continue on that uh, vein. He has identified bureaucratic sectionalism as something that he wants to eradicate uh, for Japan. So he wants very, he wants very forceful uh, executive uh, uh, action, uh, if you will. I also think it's interesting to note that his arrival is, uh, kind of, was kind of abrupt uh, in the sense that no one was expecting uh, Prime Minister Abe to resign with one year yet to go in his term and he resigned because of health uh, reasons. It was very interesting to watch how uh, immediately uh, Suga-san's approval ratings uh, went up, which indicates I think that in the Japanese public there's an appetite uh, for continuity but it's also important to know that he comes to Japan at a very difficult time when the country is in the middle of a pandemic, the worst uh, contraction in the post-war period. Uh, Japan, uh, like many other countries, has suffered both a demand and supply uh, shock. And you know, it's interesting how he has tried to navigate, as many other uh, governments have had, the uh, need to um, contain the outbreak, but not kill the economy. And there's a lot going on with his go-to travel uh, policy. And uh, that's inter an, an interesting arena to watch. A couple of uh, uh, points I would make is that I do think that domestic policy is uh, Suga's uh, passion. And the question here will be whether he can be um, more effective than Abe in delivering on the structural reform agenda on the supply side of the economy, the micro reforms. And he has already um, um, moved on two initiatives that are popular, but they're still relatively narrow. And that is, for example, to bring down the cost of um, uh, cellular service, but also to make sure that insurance covers infertility treatments. And those are, of course, popular uh, uh, initiatives, but they're not transformative. He has a couple others that uh, show more ambition. That is the digitalization of Japan and anybody that knows Japan I know that uh, uh, it's still lagging behind and it's important to move in that direction. And you know, there are plans to create a digitalization agency. And then more recently, his plans for Japan to go, to go um, uh, neutral in terms of emissions by 2050. So action on climate change. Those are huge undertakings, digitalization and uh, climate change. And the jury is still out on whether he'll be able to deliver. But to your last point, uh, Jackie, um, I don't sense when he puts out this very um, ambitious reform agenda, I don't sense that he's thinking he's going to be just around for a year. He wants more. And the question is, of course, that he needs to, um, because he's only serving the rest of prime minister's uh, his term, he needs to get reelected. He needs to win that reelection as party president. And he also needs to face uh, the voters. So people that next year, so people that follow Japanese politics uh, have bets going as to when uh, will he call a snap election? When will be the best timing for that? And there are all kinds of scenarios out there. And of course, the possibility of Tokyo uh, hosting or not, the Olympics will probably figure into that calculation. So if, if, if Suga-san stays on, then this is who the, the Biden administration uh, will have to, to deal with. And, and former Prime Minister Abe put a, a lot of time and effort uh, into managing Trump um, because of the centrality of that bilateral relationship. 
And he really succeeded in, in a way that few other US allies had. He figured out how, how to, to manage Trump. And, and Sukasan is not going to need to figure out how to manage Trump for very long. Um, and, and Mike, you talked about travel and, and how, how uh, Prime Minister, now Prime Minister Suga did not travel as cabinet secretary, but he made his first international trip, not to the United States, but to Vietnam and to, and to Indonesia. Should we read anything into that? Is he possibly seeking to put some distance between Japan and the United States? I really don't think so. I'll be interested in what um, Maria and Sari think. But if this had been Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, 10 years ago, then everyone would have been worried that this was a signal that Japan is now trying to separate from the US. Um, uh, or even in earlier periods, uh, it would have been a, a, almost a shocking development for a prime minister. But I don't think there's any concern in the outgoing Trump administration or the incoming Biden team that somehow this signals that Japan is um, de-aligning or moving away from the US. Um, I think Suga-san did this first and foremost because this was not an easy time to come to the US, you know, given everything that was happening in an election which many of us thought was over, but many thought was not. So how do you handle that diplomatically in that time? Very, very tough if you want to maintain a good relationship with the outgoing team and establish a good relationship with the incoming team. So I would not have advised him to go to the US right now or come to the US, um, despite the temptation of stopping in Seattle. Um, and then Vietnam and Indonesia, you know, Abe's signature foreign policy uh, was uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, which is a strategy that the Trump administration embraced and that the Biden administration, I'm confident will continue even if the name changes a little bit. And um, the point of this is that Japan with the US, with Australia, with other maritime democracies is going to work to shore up stability in Asia with infrastructure investment, with a capacity building for countries like Vietnam. Uh, uh, Japan has an agreement with Vietnam to provide um, patrol craft and other things to help them keep an eye on what Chinese ships are doing in their waters. So going to Vietnam and Indonesia, two critical countries um, that are very friendly with Japan right now, was a good move domestically, because these are two countries that really have good relations with Japan. Japan has a 90 to 95 percent favorability rating in Indonesia and Vietnam, so couldn't go wrong. And it signals to the U.S. Japan is going to keep shaping the regional environment, shoring up states that are under pressure from China. So I think it was a brilliant and in some ways the only move that Suga-san could make. Um, uh, so I, I, I think, I hope I should say the incoming uh, Biden administration realizes what this was all about. I think they do. Um, this was a good play for the U.S. as well as Japan. Okay, Sarah, do you have additional thoughts on that? I I fully agree with Mike on this. Uh, I, I think it was difficult to come to the U.S. at that point. Sure. And uh, Indo-Pacific is really important for Japan and Prime Minister Suga. Uh, only about two weeks, I think, prior to uh, Prime Minister Suga's visit to uh, Vietnam and Indonesia, there was a meeting of the Quad for foreign ministers. So Japan, uh, US, Australia, and, and India met in Tokyo and talked about you know, various strategies of, uh, of beefing up this uh, FOIP, the free open uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. So I think it, you know, in, in relation to that, it was important for Prime Minister Suga to go to ASEAN, which, you know, which has kind of a, a bit of a, a worry about these major powers playing a big, big voice game and not really kind of taking care of the you know, kind of main part of Southeast Asia and kind of uh, getting that bridge and be inclusive to that process is, uh, has been pretty, you know, quite important thing for, for Japan overall. So going to Vietnam and Indonesia was a, a very good move. And also when it comes to, you know, kind of security issues like South China Sea and various things, it's really important for Japan to get uh, kind of its Southeast, Asian, Southeast Asian friends to be on board with it. And, you know, especially Vietnam, oh, no, I think Mike already said that, you know, infrastructure or maybe even the kind of supply chain that's been the kind of a question at this point under COVID. Uh, both of these countries are quite important partner to, to Japan. So I think it was a really good move. By the way, uh, Prime Minister Abe actually, when he took office for the second round, he visited Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand at, the, you know, at his first visit. So maybe it was getting to be kind of a, a tradition on the part of the Japanese leaders. 
Maria, anything to add? Um, just a little bit. I mean, I think I concur with everything that's been said. And I think, you know, it was important um, and it was beneficial to the United States that Minister traveled to Southeast Asia because with this uh, transition in Japan, I think that this sends a message that the Indo-Pacific strategy remains very firmly in place. And that is one area where there is alignment between the uh, two allies. And therefore, the United States stands to benefit if Japan plays its diplomatic parts well in the region. Add to that the fact that uh, uh, Prime Minister Sula had a very positive uh, phone conversation with President-elect uh, Biden, where um, uh, Biden also referred to you know, the uh, security pact covering all territories administered by Japan, the Senkakus, which is something always that the Japanese want uh, to hear what reassurance is on. And also um, uh, Biden referred and alluded to the importance of the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, uh, here I'm curious what um, Mike and Sawi have heard, because what is interesting to me is that I don't think many um, uh, watchers of Japan in the U.S. are very troubled by the fact that the first trip, international trip of Prime Minister Suga was to the region and not to the U.S. But I do think that a lot of uh, Japanese uh, scholars are watching very closely that phone call. And there was a lot of debate as to whether why Biden used the terms as uh, secure and prosperous and not free and open, and whether this actually uh, um, would signal a major policy departure. And my, my position in that is that I think that the planks, the parameters of US-Asia policy and the importance of the Indo-Pacific remain firmly in place, regardless of the nomenclature, that it's important that we heard reassurances for the incoming uh, US president that there's Indo-Pacific is a priority. I think that, um, the, a very tough competition with uh, China is here uh, to continue. And I also think that, you know, uh, for uh, President-elect Biden, uh, democratic renewal both here and abroad is very important. So I don't see any way in which the U.S. will go soft on uh, um, values, human rights, and uh, democracy uh, uh, support. So um, to me, it's been interesting to uh, watch how much uh, it's been read into the transcripts of those phone calls. So um, I'm going to focus on, stay on security for, for just a second and then get to the trade and it's so much to talk about. Uh, but, but Japan, you know, has, has as neighbors, uh, countries that are using their military to demonstrate their power in ways that Japan doesn't. You know, you've got North Korea flinging uh, missiles over Japan and you've got China, which is, you know, changing the regional balance of power and increasingly willing to use its military to demonstrate its wealth and assert uh, its interest in the region. Um, uh, so the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance has been really crucial for both partners uh, in the region. And the previous question, you know, you, you said no, that, that uh, um, you know, Japan is not moving away from the U.S. But is there a concern in Japan that the U.S. is moving away from Japan? You had, you know, the, the troop drawdown in, in South Korea. You've had, and again, this was under the Trump administration, of course, um, uh, but not just a troop, troop drawdown and asking Japan to pay more for support. But is is there doubt, uh, either a little bit or growing doubt in Japan about the strength of the U.S. commitment to its security? And Mike, I'll start with, with you. Um, we did a survey at CSIS where I work on China policy. We surveyed a thousand members of the American public uh, and then 500 thought leaders in Europe and Asia. And we asked the question, um, how much risk should the United States take to defend Japan if it's attacked by China? And among American thought leaders on a scale of one to 10, with 10 meaning significant amounts of risk, the mean, the mean was nine. And among security experts, it was over nine. And then when we asked Japanese thought leaders, foreign policy experts, diet members in that survey, do you think, what do you think the US answer would be? They said about 8.5. So I think when it comes to defending Japan, there's quite high, I believe, there's quite high confidence in both countries. Um, however, um, I, I do also think that there's anxiety in Tokyo about whether or not the US and the new administration might fall for a Chinese gambit to go back to a kind of US-China cozy condominium. Um, in 2012 and 13, the Chinese leader Xi Jinping proposed the US and China stabilized relations by having a new model of great power relations where the US and China would basically decide everything in Asia without those you know, pesky Japanese and Australians and Koreans getting in the way. And um, 
there were people in the Obama administration at the time who thought this was a good idea, actually, and publicly said so. Um, and uh, nobody thinks it's a good idea anymore. But since the Biden administration has some people who are coming back from the Obama administration, I think in Tokyo, there's a little bit of nervousness. And that's why, to Maria's point, people in Tokyo were parsing this phone call between Joe Biden. Why did he say this? Why did he say that? Maria and I know a lot of these people uh, who were advising Joe Biden on Asia and on foreign policy and defense. None of them are going to abandon Japan and hug China as our new partner. It's it's in the, it's clear in the polls I've done at CSIS. It's clear in other public opinion polls, uh, but but the Japanese are a bit anxious uh, about that because um, uh, the U.S. card is so critical to how serious China takes them. They in order to deal with China, they've got to have a very strong, credible support from the U.S. Not just militarily, but economically and diplomatically. Um, and I think the Biden team knows that, and their early moves uh, show that. Perfect. Thanks. Maria, sorry, anything to add? Sure, if I can uh, jump in. Um, you know, just to add a uh, different dimension, I agree with what uh, Mike was just saying. And, you know, first of all, to note that Japan has no plan B. I mean, the alliance with the United States is a cornerstone of its security. And as, you know, uh, CSIS surveys uh, show, there's a strong support in the United States to keep that uh, ally uh, secure and protected. Um, also, I think it's interesting to know that even though during the um, uh, years of the Trump administration, you have a president who was rather skeptical of alliances and there was certain amount of uh, tension in the transatlantic relationship, you know, uh, also with South Korea, you know, tweets about a potential, as you mentioned, Jackie, uh, reducing troops and so forth. But despite this, I would say that U.S.-Japan relations remain in a very uh, level, uh, good keel during uh, these past uh, four years, you didn't have those presidential tweets, uh, you know, uh, um, um, uh, creating a lot of um, fear or concern uh, in, uh, in Japan. Um, but I would say that Japan was not granted special favors either. I mean, when you look at the metal tariffs, they also, uh, you know, Japanese companies were saddled with those very tough uh, bilateral trade negotiations and a tough initial approach on burden sharing. So you didn't have the upheaval of other alliances, but it's also true that, um, you know, there was uh, some um, tough issues coming uh, Japan's way. But I would also, even though I would make the case that U.S.-Japan relations are very robust and very strong and they have weathered a very unconventional presidency, I think I, there's no sugarcoating the fact that, you know, the United States faces enormous domestic uh, challenges and divisions and partisanship and the way in which we have mishandled the pandemic, I think that creates some doubt about how outward oriented how are we going to be? Are we going to be extremely distracted by our own domestic issues? It's something that we need to uh, uh, take into account. And this uh, affects how uh, the Japanese public sees the United States and the, uh, also many other publics. So for example, if you look at the Pew uh, surveys, I think that the drop in the number of people who say they have confidence in the American press in doing the right thing. I think in 2016, if I read my notes correctly, it was something like 78% in 2016. In 2020, you had gone to uh, 25%. Uh, percent. And the vast majority of the Japanese public believes that the United States has not dealt well with the pandemic, as many of us uh, do as well. So I think this is a critical moment for the United States. I mean, we always say, is, is, you know, go back to that very famous phrase of Prime Minister Abe that Japan is back. You know, this is a critical period to show that the United States is back. And the next four years are going to be critical in rebuilding our uh, credibility. And really that task starts at home with the uh, uh, ability to come together in some way and be more uh, efficient, avoid uh, uh, a Congress that's deadlocked and try to uh, address these very profound uh, socioeconomic divides that uh, we as a country confront today. Sorry, anything to add or? So, uh, uh, no, from the okay. expert in the <laughs> beltway, so I will kind of uh, I'll wait for the next but question. Can I add something on, on Professor Katata's behalf, which is to plug her book, which is, <laughs> which is excellent, which explains something very, very important in all this that neither Maria or I really touched on, which is, you know, in the 80s and 90s, the story of U.S.-Japan economic relations was largely friction. And uh, Saori's book shows how and why Japan has shifted towards uh, a position of trying to uphold 
uh, the liberal order, the international order, trading rules, intellectual property rights rules, multilateralism, trying to uphold that order in Asia. Um, and Japan has arrived at that point precisely when the US is stepping back and confused and focused on domestic issues. Um, and thank goodness, <laughs> uh, thank goodness, because um, I, I, I think we're gonna need a little time to get our act together uh, with COVID and with the economy. And uh, one thing that characterizes Abe and Suga and it comes through in Sari's book is uh, for Japan's own survival, they're, they're gonna step up and do everything they can to keep the seat warm for us um, while we um, deal with a lot of things we have to clean up at home. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe I'm overselling your argument, but that's what I took away from the book. It's really quite excellent. No, thank you, Mike, for advertising my book. <laughs> that's really wonderful. But yes, one thing I would like, really like to say is that, you know, Japan was, has been the torchbearer of the liberal economic order in, in the Asia Pacific for a while now with TPP, you know, Trump kind of left that, you know, within like two, three days after he got inaugurated. And it's been, but Japan kind of stepped in, right in, without the United States to keep CPP, CPTPP alive. Now, you know, the Asia is waiting for the US to actually kind of up its game and then be the, again, you know, kind of some, some entity that would, could really support this uh, international liberal economic order, which is kind of in a precarious position at this point. And, you know, obviously, yes, with the US, Japan can really manage this um, you know, regional economic governance uh, much more effectively. And, you know, China actually, you know, Xi Jinping said he, you know, he or China might be interesting entering in that, in that rule-based order through kind of joining you know, CPTPP. So it's, a, it's an opportunity in many ways. So this is ge generating some more terrific questions. I, I just want to follow up quickly um, on, on um, something Maria said about uh, Japan having no plan B. Um, and we know that Japan has a, a, a pacifist constitution uh, in, imposed by the US. And one thing that Abe, Abe tried to do but failed was to eliminate Article 9 of, of the Japanese constitution. So what's the motivation for Japan to, to seek um, more ways to, to grow militarily or to, to express its military power. Um, is, is this kind of concern about the US driving it or are there other factors kind of driving this effort that, that Abe had on, on Article 9 specifically? I'll just say a little bit and I'm sure that um, Mike was sorry, have much more to say. And, you know, it's true that, you know, um, Prime Minister Abe's, I think, most fervent wish, uh, his pet priority was constitutional reform and uh, reforming Article 9. But that was just, I think, um, a tool to larger purpose, and that is to have a more proactive Japan and Japan that can do more and therefore be a more uh, valuable ally to the United States, but that can also uh, look after itself uh, more. Um, so even though he didn't succeed in um, uh, reforming the uh, Constitution, I do think I would refer to him as a transformational leader when it comes to uh, security policy. There are a number of institutional reforms, the creation of the National Security Council, the adoption of a national security strategy, the reinterpretation of the right of collective uh, self-defense, a number of uh, 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 security uh, policies that were adopted on 2015 codifying uh, this. Um, and there's therefore a, a, a clear investment in the alliance versus a country that can do more and therefore be a more valuable ally. But what's also interesting, Jackie, for me is that Japan also has diversified its security relationships uh, with uh, elevating you know, the relation with India, elevating the relation uh, with uh, Australia, uh, restarting and nurturing uh, the Quad. And uh, these are now very important endeavors of uh, Japanese foreign uh, uh, policy. I think that they also, in many ways, uh, are about uh, working in alignment with the United States. These are uh, democracies. But I also think that gives Japan options if the United States continues to be distracted. And uh, you know, I think that our allies have whiplash, right? I mean, from one administration to the next, we change a lot our approach. And uh, you know, we're training a muscle in them, and that is to move on without us and many initiatives. So, uh, you know, it's all very good for the United States, but I also think that we cannot expect that we are constantly shifting from one administration to the next or withdrawing from the region and that our partners are not going to adapt because they are doing that. 
Thanks, Mike. Do you want to jump in? Yeah. So Abe, um, like his father, like his grandfather, like a lot of conservatives in Japan's ruling liberal Democratic Party, had a dream of changing Article 9 in the Constitution, which was written by American lawyers. And in Japanese, it sounds really strange. It sounds like it was, you know, written by American lawyers. But in it, Japan renounces the right of war to resolve international disputes. And so for people like Abe and, 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 and many in the Conservative Party, this is an obstacle to Japan playing a more proactive role in the world. And he, he, he couldn't change it. It's, too, it, it. it's too hard. But he did something else, which Maria briefly touched on, which is he, he pushed through uh, uh, the right for Japan to engage in what's called collective self-defense. And it's a little technical, but it's important because I think this is one of the most important things Abe did. Um, under the UN Charter, every country has the right to defend itself if attacked, but also to attack, uh, to defend an ally or friend if they're attacked, if it's going to affect everyone's security. And that goes for Japan too. But the Japanese um, government interpreted their constitution as meaning they would not exercise that right. They would only use their military if they're directly attacked. And that was very handy for Japan after World War II because the Japanese government could say, we'd love to help you in your little war in Vietnam, but we can't because of this you know, constitution, which you wrote, which we interpret as meaning we can't help you. And it was a fantastic alibi and allowed Japan to focus on economic recovery. And it was brilliant, actually, brilliant strategy for Japan. But now, in, over the last 15 years, um, the Japan's waters are full of Chinese warships. Japan now, in a way that wasn't true 15 years ago, can be hit by hundreds of North Korean missiles, potentially with biological, nuclear, and chemical weapons. Um, and, uh, and China is trying to dominate the sea lanes between Japan and Southeast Asia. So it's a completely different threat environment. And so what Abe has done is, is change the interpretation. The government has said, we now have the right to engage in collective defense under certain circumstances when it's really necessary, we can actually fight alongside US or Australian forces to defend them if it's critical for Japan's own security and survival. That, that opens up a completely new world that was never there before. And um, it really makes, it, what it means is that Abe has essentially said, I'm throwing away the alibi. I'm going to accept the risk of being entrapped in a war with the US because Japan has no choice. We need to be sure the US will be there for us. Um, it, basically saying we're in, uh, in these difficult situations, I mean, you've got to be in. And the US commander in the Pacific says, we have gone from interoperability with Japan to interdependence. This means now we need Japan. We can't move in, Japan, in Asia easily without Japan. So it's, it's made the alliance more equal, but it means each of us has more risk uh, and is more you know, uh, entrapped by what the other does, um, which is uh, gonna be, I think, a really important thing for Suga to navigate. Because now if you're depending on the US, if the polls show people are worried you can't count on the US, um, it makes his relationship with Joe Biden really, really important. So um, let's let's turn to the economic uh, part of the relationship um, before we turn it over to questions, get a few questions in here. So trade, of course, is very important here in Seattle. We are the most trade dependent state uh, in the country and Japan is the state's third largest trading partner. So really wanna make sure we're devoting some energy here to the, the bilateral economic relationship and, and trade. So I wanna, uh, and this was uh, alluded to in, in some of our earlier discussion, um, the, the bilateral, um, trade negotiations that took place and that Abe and Trump signed uh, what Trump described as a phenomenal trade deal uh, last year. You know, it certainly wasn't what Japan wanted, which was the multilateral TPP. Um, as as sorry uh, pointed out, we pulled out on day three of the Trump administration. But um, has as difficult as these negotiations may have been, was this an important deal to sustain the economic relationship? You know, was it actually phenomenal, not necessarily in terms of, of the, the economic outcome, but, but a, a way for the relationship to maintain um, for a while? Um, sorry, let's start with you. Well, I think Mireya is the expert on this, so I would like to give her the first cut on it, if, you don't, if she doesn't mind. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, you know, um, I would not use the word phenomenal. <laughs> 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 to describe these uh, negotiations, um, I think they were um, a diminished opportunity and an exercise in control damage. Um, so there was pragmatism 
you know, on Japan's part, uh, it was necessary because it was very tricky. They you know, want to go back to that uh, uh, history of, um, of friction and you're dealing with a president that cares deeply about uh, trade deficits and that's the measure he uses. So, um, you know, the market access agreement, there are two, two agreements that were generated as part of this bilateral negotiation. The, um, the digital agreement is much better. It does uh, update the rules in a critical uh, area, uh, but still compared to the TPP, it's still bilateral and therefore it does not have that wide dissemination effort. So even in the best part of these negotiation, it comes short when compared to the TPP. And then the market access agreement is extremely narrow because the United States did not want to open and liberalize auto tariffs. And that meant that Japan would not uh, uh, liberalize rice to try to look for some uh, um, uh, balance. But it means that uh, it's an agreement that uh, does not cover the majority of uh, trade. It's extremely narrow. Um, Congress was uh, marginalized. It was signed as an executive agreement, which means that the next administration can do with it uh, uh, what it pleases. And uh, the, if you want to hear crickets in the room, the only thing you have to do is ask when is stage two coming? Because nobody can tell you. And I think that the uh, Japanese side does not want to uh, talk about a, a stage two agreement because Ideally, they would like the United States to go better to the better alternative, which is a CPTPP. And, uh, you know, just my last point is that I think that when you look at the Trump administration's Asia policy, um, uh, trade deep negotiations in Asia, they came, uh, uh, what we have is a number of very uh, uh, phase one, stage one agreements that I think uh, um, do not uh, uh, stand next compared to what we could have achieved with a uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. So um, there's actually, there's a question in the chat about the CPTPP. So I wanna, uh, I wanna ask one sort of separate question and then start with the, the audience Q&A and, and start with the CPTPP uh, chat, say that five times quickly. Um, but I wanna look at, at, because, you know, Japan is constrained militarily, um, I want to look at uh, its use of economic statecraft to, to further its its foreign policy. I know uh, Mary, you can certainly speak to this, but I, I think you all can. You know how how is Japan using economic statecraft to further its foreign policy, and is it able to compete here with China, which has certainly thrown a lot of resources into using economic engagement as a diplomatic tool? Mary, we'll start with you and then go to uh, uh, sure. Mary. Well, I think that. Um, you know, uh, what goals is Japan trying to achieve first? And then what tools is it using? And I think that Japan actually has engaged not just during Abe, but this is a longer term trajectory and a very robust set of uh, economic statecraft measures and economic engagement as a tool of diplomacy uh, very effectively. So I would say that, you know, uh, Japan faces some very stark re uh, um, realities with demographic uh, decline. That means that the domestic market is going to shrink and therefore Japan's need to be, needs to be a network economy, needs to be integrated uh, uh, with the region and elsewhere. Uh, so that's one uh, first goal. The second goal is of course, to anchor the United States uh, to the region because it's a security guarantee. You don't want the United States to be a new and that's an important uh, uh, goal to also achieve through economic statecraft. Third goal to try to avoid an, uh, a Chinese uh, a Chinese dominance of the region. That only it's only China who is actively uh, courting these countries. It's only China who's actively uh, creating webs of economic interdependence. So to give diversification alternatives to developing Asia is also a very important uh, goal, I think, um, for uh, Japan. And I think that Japan has played its cards very well. Uh, uh, Saori can speak uh, uh, in greater length about the infrastructure investment push of Japan. Uh, but on the trade front, Japan went from being a very passive defensive player to now having helped broker two mega trade agreements, the CPTPP, but also the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership. It has become a leader, it has found its voice in terms of codifying rules on trade, investment standards, it has shown that it has convening uh, power. Uh, nobody thought that the, CPT, the TPP could leave a second life and Japan proved them uh, wrong. And it has had the financial muscle. And when you compare how much China is doing with infrastructure finance and how much Japan is doing, actually those are, uh, th that's the game. 
those are the two players in the region. The United States has some hopes, but actually we have not really put the money, nor have we really uh, got ourselves together uh, uh, in a coherent way to be a major uh, player. Oh, sorry, and that, you had, oh, sorry, keep going. Stop is that uh, we should talk about also, uh, it's not just economic integration, China's rise also now has created a very powerful incentive for what we refer to as economic security. So defensive measures to prevent critical leakage of uh, uh, technology to China. And Japan is there for now in the midst of that, trying to balance its policies for uh, deeper economic integration, but also uh, adopting some economic defensive measures when it comes to the screening of foreign direct investment, cybersecurity, onshoring subsidies, and so forth. So it's a very, very important time in the region where you have competing pressures and many uh, countries having to figure out how to navigate that. Okay, thanks. Sorry? So just quickly to add, I mean, you know, Mireya summarized it very well, so I have not much to add, but, you know, I agree with her that, you know, for this region, not only for Japan, but for this region, East Asia, economic security, and we called it, you know, back when Prime Minister Ohira was, uh, you know, the leader back in the late 70s, uh, the comprehensive security included many of these you know, different elements of security, not only the military security, and I think in economic security and the use of economic measures, which is the economic statecraft has been very important for Japan. You know, foreign aid is one of them, and now it's the infrastructure investment. And even though, and in some ways, Japan has an advantage in the context of East Asia, dealing, kind of managing the relationship with the advanced nations like the US and you know, UK or whatnot, uh, because Japan has gone through developmental stage, which, which resonate with the Asian countries. So Japan has been protectionist. Japan has had you know, many of the measures that America criticized quite bitterly in the past. Now Japan has kind of matured to the extent that now it's the leader to uphold the liberal economic order. So they are the, Japan is in place to kind of convince others, including China, I would argue, that, you know, kind of you, you know, these countries would mature to some extent, you know, to, to certain, certain, at a certain level, then they would need these better rules of uh, liberal order in order to kind of enhance the you know, kind of economies of scale and, and kind of going beyond just the nationalist, nationalist and protectionist kind of measures. So in many ways, economic statecraft is you know, kind of continues to be a crucial element of the Asia Pacific relationship. And Japan is the one which has the experience and instruments to be able to kind of uphold Kind of the, the kind of a, you know, better rules moving forward, you know, it reflected on trade investment as well as infrastructure too. So we have a, a question um, from Michael Wills, who's with the NBR here in Seattle, um, and he noted, as as you all have, that Prime Minister Abe worked hard to keep the CPTPP CPT alive um, as an option, and that the U.S. joining that agreement would be an important part of achieving the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy that we we've, we've already talked about. So what do you all anticipate to be the prospects of U.S. admission to the CPTPP under, under Biden and, and Suga-san? Mike, you, you said that, that Japan's been keeping the seat warm for us, um, but uh, if you guys can look in your crystal balls, do you, do you think that, there's, that the U.S. is going to actively seek to engage again? Um, I think if, if, if President-elect Biden, or say after January 20th, President Biden, um, said that he is going to get the US back into TPP or CPTPP. That would probably be the most single most important thing he could do to reassure not only Japan, but Australia, Singapore, a lot of countries in that region. I would bet he doesn't quite do it though. I think the politics don't line up quite right for that in Washington. I hope I'm wrong. <clears throat> um, polls about TPP uh, that were taken at the time Donald Trump pulled us out of it, showed that 60% of Americans supported it. Um, the problem is the opposition is really intense. And I would bet in, 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 in Washington state, it's 90% as a trade dependent state. And the problem is the opposition to TPP or any multilateral trade agreement is concentrated in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, swing states. So they have an outsized influence. And so you'll notice that during the campaign, um, the Biden team didn't want to talk about that at all because it doesn't help you get votes in a really tough fight. Um, but behind the scenes, 
beginning with Joe Biden himself, a lot of them were instrumental in getting the U.S. into TPP and, and know how important it is for rulemaking uh, in the region um, and for, frankly, putting constructive pressure on China uh, to start negotiating on some of these issues with all of us uh, at a later stage. Um, so I'm, the politics are tough. The best case scenario, and Maria follows this very closely too, I, the best case scenario I can see is that, um, that a President Biden signals that the US needs to get back into leading on trade, multilateral trade in Asia, but doesn't say, I'm going to join TPP. Because technically, if he says that, it triggers congressional notification, very legalistic stuff. So he signals it and then perhaps focuses on a sectoral agreement, maybe around digital trade with the TPP members, a sort of way station. That's not the best thing for U.S. interests overall, but politically, giving everything on his plate, that might be the best we get. But maybe I'm too pessimistic. Miria, tell me I'm too pessimistic or too optimistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think that's about the uh, right, uh, realistic. I think is a good <laughs> word. Um, you know, I don't think trade is going to be number one priority because the politics are tricky and also because the domestic agenda is so pressing. And, you know, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, economic recovery is going to be figure first and foremost. Also, we shouldn't forget that um, Biden has run with like a big tent democratic coalition which means that there are very different views uh, on trade. And trade is an issue that does uh, um, create a lot of emotion in many people and certainly among uh, Democrats. So I don't think that there's already a consensus as to what is the right balance between what the US has negotiated in prior trade agreements and what um, the progressive side of the Democrats would like to, to see incorporated now in these uh, trade agreements. For that reason, I do think that there is merit. The United States cannot just you know, tell the region, sorry, uh, I'm looking domestically, <laughs> you figure it out and then I'll come back. That would be, I think, uh, the election of duty. So what can we done with these domestic politics but the need to assure and engage in the region? I think the place to start is, as Mike said, you know, digital negotiations. Uh, they do not create the same uh, pushback. There are other things you can do on supply chain resiliency or economic security dialogues to make sure that you're talking about best practices and to have coordination uh, with allies. Those I think could master the very fractured domestic politics. But the real important play here is when will the United States return to the region? Now you have two mega trade agreements and the United States is looking from the outside and that's certainly not good. I think that the play has to be for uh, seeking admission into the TP CPTPP. That's the agreement that was uh, ratified by the uh, members, um, not the original TPP. But there's, you know, uh, uh, trade negotiations the art, uh, is an art. And there is, I think, a possibility to find areas of overlap between the CPTPP and the US Mexico Canada trade agreement. Yeah. And we should not lose sight of the fact that the USMCA actually was a bipartisan vote. That's a rarity. And therefore that's why we need to hold on to that as a potential you know, <laughs> roadmap. And you know, the CPPPP suspended the rules on biologics that you know, were not popular. Now the Democrats don't want those rules anymore. So that's an area of convergence. And I do think that uh, for the US to come back, the CPTPP countries should be amenable to some targeted reforms on labor and environment and climate change. But what they could get in return is that because it's an accession negotiation, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter because the agreement goes on. It's not like with the original TPP that if it doesn't work out, the whole thing might sink. But also I would imagine they have asks of their own. And one ask I would have about we're advising these other CPTPP countries is a US commitment to not use 301s and unilateral tariffs without exhausting first the dispute settlement mechanism in the CPTPP. To rein in US unilateralism might be the way in which you can uh, get some uh, traction with these countries. But that's not for the first six months, first year of the Biden administration. I think that we have to wait a little bit longer. He needs to get a near fall also from all leaders in Asia first. Yes. Yes. That will have more <laughs> impact than you think, actually. Yeah. <laughs> all right, anything to add? No, I think, yeah, I agree with it. It's, it's hard for the US. Meanwhile, I think, you know, Japan is really kind of hoping that something domestically in the US can work, work out so that it will be back on the table in, you know, sometime in the near future. 
I just add really quickly, the digital yeah. trade agreement is, I think, the right focus. I'm glad Maria sees it the, the same way I do, because she knows a lot more about trade than I do. The, the other aspect, though, which is not a trade agreement, is um, the future of 5G. And Japan and the U.S. will be at the center of whatever regulatory um, framework establishes an alternative to Huawei uh, for 5G for, for, for leading democracies. And that's not a traditional you know, WTO multilateral trade agreement, that's about regulatory and technology development um, issues. And, and, and so those kind of issues in the long run may end up being more significant than whether or not you lower tariffs or raise tariffs or deal with behind the border issues on intellectual property rights. So I think the US can get back in the game without CPTPP in some really critical high tech areas um, that, 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 that you know, cause less blowback within the American political system. Well, I, I hope uh, the Biden administration is, is listening to all of this, this wise counsel. Uh, we are going to call on one of our audience members who has their hand raised. So um, I'll just give my team a sec to uh, encourage Jean Edelhorst to unmute herself and then ask her question. Right, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm Jean Edelhart, a partner with a local foundation. So here in the U.S., you know, we're of course closely watching Biden's cabinet picks to see what those choices may signal. And so I'm interested in the panelists' view on what Prime Minister Suga's cabinet picks tell us about his approach to government and his priorities. Um, and I guess alongside with that, uh, I'm curious if he's brought any more women into the cabinet, because I think both Abe and Suga have spoken about the importance of empowering women, but I don't know if he's actually modeled that through his own appointments. Terrific question. Thanks, Jean. Um, Sour, should we start with you? Well, so as far as I can see, uh, Prime Minister Suga's cabinet pick kind of demonstrate that he's going to Stay on stay on course uh, along with uh, Prime Minister Abe's, uh, the uh, kind of Foreign Minister, uh, Defense Minister. Many of them are kind of com uh, the Prime Minister Abe's kind of connection and uh, kind of past you know, prime Foreign Minister. So continuity is clearly the case. When it comes to women, I I don't one I can't remember how many there were two, not not very you no know, not doing very well at all at this point, uh, while you know, I'm sure there are other considerations. You know, I think Prime Minister Suga doesn't have a faction, you know, doesn't belong to a kind of concrete faction and that kind of creates some um, kind of difficulty in you know, fighting on, on the kind of balance. But I, I'll ask others to comment. Yeah, please, Mike or Maria. Maria? No, not really nothing to add beyond what Sari said. Yeah. Okay. Same here. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. I mean, I, it, it, I, I, we're giving the impression that his cabinet is boring, but actually, <laughs> it is a little boring when you think about it. <laughs> there are a few colorful, colorful characters like uh, Georgetown grad Kono Taro, oh. who is now working on, among other things, digitizing the economy. Um, but it's 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 not a super dynamic cabinet. It's very competent, very good at behind the scenes maneuvering, very good at making the bureaucrats move. And reassuring for the business community, but it's but I hadn't thought about it until you asked the question. It's not a super exciting cabinet in a way. Yeah, I think it? I think the main person that you might you know, kind of keep eye on is the uh, you know uh, uh, Nikai San, the, yeah. you know, who is the behind the scene kingmaker, who seems to have quite a bit of an influence at this point uh, on Prime Minister. Well, boring cabinets can be good. So uh, let's let's go to another uh, question. Uh, this one was submitted a while ago from uh, Joe Wallace. So Joe is uh, on the military affairs team at Microsoft and is a retired uh, US Marine Corps officer and was stationed in Japan. And he's gonna be hosting two um, uh, Japan Defense Forces officers at Microsoft next year. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's curious about the China angle. How, do, how does the US and Japan continue the close security cooperation framework as China continues to flex its muscles, so to speak, in the region? with the uncertainty of China and where it might next threaten the security of the region and our increasing economic ties there. How does US manage the relationship with Japan and keep China at bay? And Mike, I'll ask you to take the first crack at that. So I'm gonna get very wonkish in my answer, I'm afraid, but um, by changing the interpretation of Article 9 to allow collective self-defense with the US, especially, but also Australia and other um, partners, um, uh, Japan took a big step forward, um, but if I worked in the Pentagon for a while, so 
if the next thing, frankly, is um, uh, if we're really going to be effective as allies responding to very fast paced crises with China and North Korea and the region, we need to move towards something like what we have with NATO or Korea, which is a joint and combined command, um, a, a, a relationship where we're not going to have the same uh, re- uh, command structure we have with NATO or with Korea. Japan's uh, constitution situation is different. But um, we are just starting with Japan to do detailed contingency planning. You know, there are big questions. Who is in charge in a contingency in that part of the world? Uh, is it the commander of the Navy, 7th Fleet? Is it the indo pacom commander? Is it the Marines? Uh, is it the US Forces Japan commander? It's a little bit unclear. And in Japan, if there's a crisis, who's in charge? The, the, the chairman of the Joint Staff Office? Well, in the US and Australia and Britain, that person never is in charge in a fight because they're basically a political person. So there's some, the next big thing I think for the US and Japan to be more effective as military allies is, is command and control relationships and structure. And, um, you know, we've hit the Trump administration rightfully very hard for retreating on trade and diplomacy. On defense policy, they've been very forward leaning and have really moved the relationship forward. But I'd say that's the next, the next big challenge. Um, and then alongside that, Japan is developing much closer defense ties with Australia, with, with Vietnam, with India. Um, so th- making those relationships more institutionalized and effective in a crisis um, is the next big thing, I think, for dealing with the problem that the speaker raises. Any other additions or? Well, I, I would talk a little bit about, uh, you know, U.S.-Japan uh, relations and how to deal with the China challenge, not from the uh, military security side that uh, Mike already covered, but perhaps uh, the economic side and the tech issues and, and so forth. Just a, a number of very uh, general uh, comments. And one is, um, I think that, um, Obviously, uh, you know, um, Japan is uh, keenly aware of the pressure coming from uh, China. Uh, The uh, constant pressure in the Senkaku means that even though there was recent destabilization of bilateral relations, that it's understood that, you know, uh, um, China represents a threat in many ways. And uh, how you balance that with a very robust uh, uh, links of economic interdependence is a challenge that faces Japanese policymakers as it faces many other countries in the region. And I think that if I were to describe the Japanese approach, I would call it one of selective uh, competition. So what they've done is that in some areas, they're marking the line and therefore in FDI screening, for example, they have tightened, they have moved in the direction of the United States. Um, They're going to bypass uh, the Chinese telecom when it comes to 5G, as Mike was referring to also, because they see that cybersecurity risks. But importantly, when they do that, they don't make a China-specific uh, legislation, but they just uh, uh, talk about a general uh, cybersecurity concern. And I bring this up because you know sometimes, even though they, there is a strong desire to coordinate with the United States, there is some reticence because of the way in which the United States has chosen to play its competition in these arenas with China. Uh, the, uh, the tariff war well, there are a lot of casualties uh, among Japanese companies. The tech uh, um, curves uh, affecting uh, Chinese telecom have also affected uh, Japanese uh, companies. So there's a real concern with the fragmentation of supply chains, with a splintered uh, internet, with getting caught in the U.S. sanctions uh, regime. And uh, there's also, you know, um, little appetite, for example, uh, um, there is this recent initiative by the State Department called the Clean Network, Um, And I think that there's been reluctance of Japan and others to participate because the way in which that initiative is drafted, it is China specific or PRC specific, and they don't want to come out and just to put themselves so directly in confrontation with China. What they would say is let's call out the behavior, but that uh, in a way in which seems to be neutral language and uh, we avoid unnecessary friction. So there's a lot of alignment, but a lot of disagreement on tactics. And that's an important um, Arena, I think now that we have an incoming uh, Biden administration to see if we can bring the two allies closer together and how they play their cards in this very important set of issues. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. So when it comes to Japan's relation with China, you know, there's another term is cooperative competition. So selective competition, cooperative competition, 
Japan has to live with China forever, cannot pack up and leave from that, that position, geographic position it is in. And the interdependent, economic interdependence is you know, quite profound at this point. So there are many ways in which Japan is managing this relationship along with the very important relationship with the US. Uh, so you know, that's the kind of foundation of how we see Japan in between US and in China. So this will be our last question. We've talked a lot about COVID, so let's end on, on one on COVID um, from Karen Allen, um, who says, thank you for the great panel and discussion. I agree. Um, her question is, can some of Japan's and Korea's approach to handling COVID-19 open some bridges of cooperation for the US and Japan? Uh, can, the, can the new administration reach out and use COVID as a topic to address together? Um. That would be my hope, um, but, <laughs> but um, that's a challenging one, right? US, if I understood the question is whether the common challenge of COVID could bring Japan and Korea closer, was that? No, no, it's, it's focused on uh, Japan and US. So oh, can, and US. can the US uh, learn lessons from, from Japan's approach and can this be <laughs> another avenue to, to build cooperation between the countries and the new administrations? Um, Sure, <laughs> I guess I will say that. And, um, there's, um, you know, I think that uh, for one thing, um, masking, right? Something as basic as using masks and that their use is almost universal in Japan. And you do see some very small groups in front of Shibuya station complaining about masks, but they're really pockets. So I think that, um, I think that the pandemic also, uh, puts a spotlight on the social fabric of countries. Uh, it's not just how governments are either competently organized or not, but it's how the message to the public is conveyed. And hopefully we don't politicize this very basic uh, uh, public health uh, measures. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that with the Biden administration, there would be a focus on going back to science, um, listening to these uh, health advisories. I think that there could be a lot of interesting conversations in what is the right way to handle, as I said before, the pandemic risk versus the economic risk and uh, how you can therefore have more targeted uh, uh, um, restrictions on activity that address in the most, the most imminent uh, dangers to public health without then creating a, a, a permanent uh, damage to our livelihood. So I imagine there's plenty uh, to talk about. I do think that Japan by and large has been uh, very efficient in the way in which it has uh, dealt with the COVID pandemic. It's not usually referred to as the start cases like New Zealand, like Taiwan and so forth. But when you look at the numbers and especially the number, the death rate, from COVID is actually very, very uh, modest and certainly compared with the United States. So I think that's certainly something that could be uh, a productive area of bilateral dialogue. Perfect. You know, the, the US is, uh, I agree with all that. I think there's a lot we can learn from Japan. There's even more we could learn from Korea and Taiwan, and, but we won't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're a very divided country um, around, um, uh, identity issues that perfectly intersect with mask wearing and trust in government and personal liberty. I would argue uh, this, you know, we are less divided as a country politically than Korea or Taiwan, which were cleaved through the middle by Cold War divisions and where there's incredible um, polarization and anger between the left and right in both Taiwan and, and Korea. But on this issue on mask wearing, it's just not an issue between the left and right in those countries. But unfortunately for us, it's become kind of a symbolic issue uh, in a very, very old debate in the US about the role of government and personal liberty. Um, so we're not gonna learn from them. But, uh, but on the second half of the question, could we cooperate more? Absolutely. And, um, you know, Moon Jae-in, the president of Korea proposed to Donald Trump that perhaps in the G20 summit meeting, Korea and the US and other countries could learn best practices, um, uh, you know, learn how to, you know, reform the World Health Organization together instead of just pulling out so the international diplomacy of this is, is sitting there waiting to be picked up. And I think the Biden administration will. Uh, I wish we would learn more from these countries. In our own defense, Korea and Taiwan, especially, and China, and to some extent, Japan, already dealt with this with MERS, with SARS, with avian influenza. We're getting hit with it really for the first time. And they had a bit of a learning curve advantage over us. Um, but if we were smart, we would really look at what Taiwan and Korea and Japan are doing. I think, I think many ways. Uh, Asia is waiting for the United States to come back to the table again, to really be 
are part of the you know kind of member to discuss and work out these crises. And you know, I think this you know could be an opportunity actually for Biden administration to show that U.S. is back in the multilateral setting and being willing to be you know at least one of the leaders in containing this crisis. So hopefully, yep. it's an opportunity. The crisis being an opportunity. Well, I love when we can end our programs on a somewhat optimistic note. It's it's uh, often been been hard to do. Um, so to Dr. Katata, Dr. Zali, Dr. Green, thank you so much for your time today. This was such a terrific conversation. A huge thanks, of course, to the Sasakawa uh, Foundation for supporting it. And thanks you all for joining us with that. Uh, I hope it is actually sunny here in Seattle. So I hope people are able to uh, go out and take advantage of some sun before the gray comes in for the next few months. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jackie. Yeah, thank you, Jackie.